enough, right? And I, you know, to your point, we are at the very beginning of this. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's privacy concerns, there's other kind of issues that need to be kind of properly navigated. Um, but it is exciting. And I think it answers um, a critical question uh, that, that I'm sure gets posed to you from your critics around like, okay, so you're making these breakthroughs and you're trying to understand, you're understanding better what's happening with the microbiome, et cetera, and everything that's going on, you know, on your platform. But like, why does this matter? Like, how are we translating this into anything actionable? Like, what is the reality of personalized uh, medicine versus the promise or the hype? And, you know, how close are we to kind of... Uh, um, bridging that gap between our aspiration and you know what we're actually capable of of providing you know the interested consumer. Yeah, well, there's certainly plenty of critics of personalised nutrition, which is what mm -hmm. you know, we're into, as opposed to medicine. I mean, because that's in a way the personalised medicine has been discussed before, particularly with regard to genetics and uh, genetic testing and things like that. And, selecting drugs on the basis right. of those things. We won't remember the blood type diet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. That was a, a, a fantastic <laughs> yeah. example. That's right. Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of rubbish. Yeah. But the the new era of personalized nutrition, A, a we've we've published you know peer review papers in Nature Medicine, you know, high quality mm -hmm. journals to show there are these big individual differences that are real. Um, we have uh, performed a, a randomized controlled trial of, sort of unpersonalized approaches, you know, standard US advice versus uh, people doing the ZOE program, who um, haven't unblinded the results, but I can, uh, I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm very confident they're, uh, they're going to be good. So the randomized controlled trial is the best way to, to tell whether it's mm -hmm. better than, you know, uniform advice. Um, and I think the other the other reason is that as soon as something's personalised to you, you're much more likely to take um, believe it. I think that's what we've shown in all of these all of these citizen science ideas that if you can make it, this is your response. It's not just the average response. It's not like everybody you know mm -hmm. who goes on this diet does well. We know that you respond to this. You will do it. So your adherence to it is much more likely. Your your level of belief is so much higher. And if that's backed up by science, then um, I think you know it's inevitable. It's going to happen. So these critics, yes, we need to do these big studies. We need to do the randomised controlled trials. These critics are generally you know, hanging on to the past and old style nutrition, and they will be dropping off. This, mm -hmm. this is absolutely the the future. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you know, yes, we won't be able to sort out all the problems. Um, you know, we're a long way from. An, I don't know working out exactly how much protein every individual has because we don't have ways of measuring protein response in the body and things but you know for for glucose uh, and for lipid levels and and assessing how much those people need I think we're we're doing a pretty good job now so um, and you know I think the studies will show that people um, feel better Anecdotally, we, the people were saying they felt better, and, and the randomized control trials mm -hmm. actually are saying saying the same thing. And uh, I think the the bit we've always been forgotten about nutrition, which we didn't know, is things like energy. Um, it's never really been asked before in nutrition trials. You know, what's your mood and energy like when you change from, say, a high fat or a high low, or you know, whatever it is, you switch around to something that suits you, and you don't get these spikes in your sugar or you don't get this your triglycerides hanging around your body which means you get less inflammation we're seeing that in, in everything we do is this this report of i feel more energy right and i think that's 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 really important so it's not just about weight and uh you know the, the sort of external stuff it's it's finding out what foods m make you feel good and mm -hmm. uh, well you know this from running you know yeah of course of sports course people do this by trial and error yeah that the average non-sports person 
you know, has to rely on other other tricks to do it and may not have thought about it in the same way as a performance athlete. Right. Um, one of the diagnostic tools that you're using for this is the continuous glucose monitor. Um, and that, you know, I want to talk more broadly about metabolic health in general and how that relates to the microbiome. But with respect to CGMs, um, there's there's a lot of squabbling around that as well. There's a certain kind of subset of the type one diabetic community that, that seems unhappy with the fact that this is available to consumers more broadly. And, I, you know, I believe that that comes from perhaps an affordability or access perspective. Um, there's another kind of contingent of people who don't like it because they think that, uh, you know, kind of, a uh, an undue fixation on CGM metrics alone paints, uh, you know, an incomplete picture of what you should or should not be eating, et cetera. Um, and there's, you know, kind of the whole, the whole like biohacker community around it um, that's drawing uh, conclusions that aren't necessarily completely solid because of an over reliance on on that variable over kind of a matrix of of complementary value. So, can you talk a little bit about um, the benefits and and perhaps the limitations of the use of a CGM? Like I've used it, I found it to be super interesting. Um, I I drew a lot of you know kind of um, non intuitive conclusions about my lifestyle habits and certain foods that were contributing to spikes and valleys, et cetera. Um, but I think without adequate education, it's very easy for a consumer to perhaps adopt less than savory dietary habits because their sole focus is on like flattening that curve. We agree on that. Um, so, you know, for anyone who hasn't tried it, they are an amazing educational tool about how your body works. Okay, so it's it's like you suddenly do this amazing science experiment on yourself and seeing how your body's reacting in real time, which is kind of, you know, it, it's amazing really. You, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have dreamt this would be mm -hmm. possible. And, and, and we think that within five years, you know, most of the smartwatches might actually have some capability to do this as well. So it, it's not going away. Um, like any new technology, it's going to be misused by some people or overused or overhyped, et cetera. And yeah, certainly for the type 1 diabetics, there was a time when they were run out of supply, so they couldn't get it. No, mm -hmm. Absolutely understand why they were angry. People just doing it for fun when, you know, they're risking... Right. Uh, um, you know, fatal hypos without them. So they're incredibly useful. But the... Um, they are, the, uh, a complaint against uh, Zoe was that they weren't very reliable. We did a study where we gave 300 users uh, one on each arm and looked at those and they, they worked out really pretty well for the purposes we're using it. Um, we've also looked at whether, you know, compared to standard blood tests, they are, do they add anything to just taking a baseline blood sugar and insulin level and a HbA1c? And by looking at over your two weeks, your time in range and the very glycemic variability, uh, you can predict who's unwell or not better than those baseline tests. So there is an we've shown there's a clear advantage even in normal people mm -hmm. to having them as a sort of predictive tool. Uh, there are lots of ways of misusing them. I, I agree that if you don't have a clear program with it that puts it into some context, you would, you know, using it just as a toy, uh, you reach some wrong conclusions. And one of the common ones is that the only way to eat is to have a completely flat... Uh, right. If you eat a 100% fat diet, yeah. like you're going to have an awesome curve, you right? Do, you it's just gonna put, be flat. Exactly. You, <laughs> just, you just put ice cream on everything, yeah. or whatever it is, and you know, you just you just cream on everything, you, you sort it out. And clearly that's wrong. And it, and that's why, something with Zoe, we, we see it's just one of the, of these three tests, really. It's, it's, it's one part of the, your score is your glycemic score. But we need to know how you handle fats. Uh, and that's why the Zoe test has a, a blood prick spot and your six-hour triglyceride test, see how much is hanging around, and of course your gut microbes and those, you know, 
we need a more holistic view of it mm -hmm. rather than getting obsessed about that one increment of it because you have to if you are going to control your blood spikes if for sugar you've got to make sure that you're not giving yourself too much fats you're tipping that so your your fats are hanging around the blood you're going to get atherosclerosis and inflammation and also the foods you're eating are also good for your gut microbes so if you have a more holistic view of it then i think it it it, it is reasonable to use these and i think they are a great educational tool to show people that some of their common things they were eating like their standard sliced loaf bread which they thought was super healthy is giving them this massive spike which you know mm -hmm. what mine looks like if i ate supermarket bread um and certain fruits for example that they thought were super healthy and like me you know bananas you know which i used to take as my standard every single day fruit not particularly good for me i think these are things that are useful because they start making you think about food in a different way and i think uh, but out of context i think they can be dangerous to some people but if you think about it you also got to think about your fats you got to think about how good that food is for your gut microbes and accept that you will all yeah you can still have some sugar spikes every now and again uh it's normal that's physiology let's not get obsessed about it but um seeing it in real time it is is kind of cool and that's a glimpse i think of the future you know they'll soon someone will invent a lipid test in real time and it'll be on your watch soon so you'll be able to see how these uh, right all of these different readings about what's happening in real time within in your, your body. body i think it's inevitable yeah, which uh, is interesting and fascinating but like a real basic question here is like why should we care about this like we see you know let's say you have a cgm you see the you know the the your blood glucose go up it goes down why is this important what is metabolic health and why should we you know be paying attention to this in the first place these spikes in sugar and or triglycerides are part of normal physiology so you know our body is designed to do that way but if there's too many of them and the spikes are too prolonged you either get a build up of uh, so the, the sugar spikes will create rise in insulin which can can start getting um insulin resistance and long term you might end up more likely to get diabetes pushing you towards pre-diabetes etc and that build up in triglycerides um, are particularly related to inflammation and you get inflammation in the blood vessels over time that stress builds up and again heart disease and other mm -hmm. metabolic problems so it's the idea is that if you can calm that down so you're not having as many of those spikes in the day then your inflammation levels are lower and we've we've shown that they are related to blood inflammation markers you will reduce your risk of many common chronic diseases most of which are related to some extent to what we call chronic inflammation the sort of low level stress in the body and other studies have shown that people who have um, are prone to these sugar spikes end up long term with more diabetes and heart disease so there are there are sort of mm -hmm. links that you can make epidemiologically we also know that some of these big spikes we showed uh, there's something called a sugar dip so one in one in three men you know, one in three women one in four uh, men after a carby say breakfast or, or or lunch three hours later we'll have a dip below baseline and you say well okay that's not going to worry about but we we followed uh, a large number of these people and it turns out they um report being more tired uh, they don't know what their result they were blind to their result they were more tired um they were more hungry and they overate by uh about 300 mm -hmm. calories that day so these sugar dips which you get from highly refined foods and carbs are actually making you overeat as well so they over time will make you gain much more weight than someone who's not having these, uh, these right. dips so some people are even more susceptible than others and what is the relationship between metabolic health and the microbiome like how does uh, a robust healthy microbiome in turn uh, help you maintain uh, a healthy, uh, you know, a, a, a healthy metabolic, you know, sort of uh, profile. We don't know. 
is the mm-hmm. is the true answer. But we do know that uh, all the epidemiology studies show that people with poor metabolic health, so with type two diabetes, with obesity, with high blood pressure, with autoimmune disease, inflammation, all have uh, low diversity microbes. Uh, poor ratios of good to bad bugs so there's a clear association Mm -hmm. there and then you can do voice studies in mice to uh, show a cause effect relationship of these sort of inflammatory microbes that are maybe producing chemicals that are making the whole problem worse so it's a bit of a vicious circle so the microbiome reacts to people with poor metabolic health end up getting unhealthier microbes but we also know that having unhealthy microbes makes you more likely to also have poor metabolic health so it's 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 a you know it's both cause and effect relationships mm-hmm. so we don't understand exactly how they do all this um there's so many chemicals involved so many microbes involved that um we don't yet know the details but we do know that there's these very clear associations and that you can improve metabolic health sort of dramatically in a lot of animal models by improving the, the microbes or uh, things like fecal transplants in mice and things like this. So, Right. Know. So in other words, if you, if you are, are getting indicia that, that um, you're having some level of insulin resistance, um, the immediate kind of first thing to do would be to make sure that you're getting 30 varieties of plants in your diet, like improving the quality of your microbiome, which in turn may have some positive impact on um, buttressing against that insulin sensitivity. Yes. Is that, is that a leap or is that? No, I think that, but that's, a, that's general for most of the chronic diseases that mm-hmm. are related to inflammation. So yes, so we know that people who have poor metabolic health have pro-inflammatory microbes. They have species that actually thrive off, you know, the stressed cytokines and and all these other uh, stress hormones and if you can if you can change those and get some of the good guys in there instead and drive down the bad ones right. you can uh, reduce some of the, the, mm. the impact of those diseases so mm. these haven't been studied in big enough um, nutritional trials yet but everything points to that, that is that is the direction we should going and it so far we for most of these diseases, there don't seem to be very specific microbes that are involved. It's more the general community is is all changed. So it's just the environment has just shifted. Mm-hmm. And it could be something subtle just by changing the pH mm-hmm. of the gut. Just a fraction makes a big difference between it being you know, beneficial or, or pro-inflammatory and itself producing more of the problems. Mm. That's fascinating. And, you know, as this continues to scale up, obviously you'll continue to learn more. Right? Yeah, and, you know, and, you know um, Christopher Gardner, I know you're probably going to be talking to him soon, did a really uh, neat study where gave intensive amounts of fermented foods to, um, to volunteers and looked at their inflammation and immune levels over the next few weeks. And they showed one, one arm was given just fiber and the other arm was given fermented foods. And mm-hmm. um, both groups improved to some extent, but the one that had the biggest I- immune impact and reduced inflammation was the fermented foods group. Mm-hmm. So we know we can change in just a few weeks quite a lot of these these basic mechanisms that are important to so many chronic diseases and yet most doctors never suggest these as treatments they always you know reach for the uh, the prescription pad mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's amazing how fast that is too yeah how exactly. mutable it really is Th- that was the surprising thing that it j- just uh, it was it was four weeks of intensive meal deliveries um, so they knew you know they were, they were getting this this stuff uh, and then they had four weeks where they were just trying it on their own but it was um, mm. uh, you know the results really were very striking and that's what it had a really big impact but no mm. one had done those studies before which is sort right. of shocking as well right 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 because we just said oh well that's just yogurt that's not real uh-huh. treatment you know that's uh, that's hippie stuff you know we don't we don't believe in that but <laughs> these you know Luckily, they did all a you know, huge range of, of blood tests and, and microbe tests. So, yeah, in a few weeks, you can really change your your gut health and 
influence disease. And I think that's that's the message. And this whole mess about why you know medicine, why, why food really is medicine, and we should right. come back to that. You know, and not start saying, well, that you have to be a nutter if you say yeah. that. You know, did did Hippocrates actually say that, or is that apocryphal? Uh, I, we don't know. I, I haven't seen his original text, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, I, but uh, it's nice to think he would have said it. I, I, I like to believe that as well. Um, the other uh, kind of really exciting, interesting field where we're seeing a lot of exciting developments is in at the intersection of the microbiome and cancer research, right? So... Um, Explain a little bit about what's going on with that, um, specifically with respect to, to melanoma and to some extent, um, even lymphoma, right? Yeah, well, it all comes down to this new approach to cancer, which is to realize that it's actually an immune problem rather than a sort of mutation problem um, because we're all getting micro cancers all the time and our immune system, if it's healthy, is picking them off before they get too big. And so that's why the immune system aging and cancer have got this sort of close link. We've never really um, realized how important it was until these immunotherapy drugs come, have come along, these so-called checkpoint inhibitors, which have been sort of game changers for many people with some of these solid tumors, uh, particularly melanoma, but to a lesser extent, kidney and lung and mm. um, some prostate, that you're using these drugs to boost the immune system to attack the, um, uh, 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 the cancer cell and get round its defenses. And um, so, you know, mortality rates were sort of, you know, not 95% and they've, these drugs have really ch changed it so they're sort of half, you know, they've halved, doubled the survival rate in, in, the, in these particular conditions. It doesn't uh, affect most cancers, but these ones. And what we've seen is that the, uh, there were some early studies showing that the microbiome had, might have a role in this and that uh, the state of the microbiome was, was important because uh, it was interacting, because as I mentioned, how important it is for the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want a really powerful immune response in order to fight that cancer for that drug to work. Uh, so there are a few early studies of this suggesting this might be the case. And uh, we got together with a, a UK charity and got a consortium of um, other uh, cancer centers in the UK and the Netherlands and we got uh, several hundred melanoma cases end stage these are people with terminal sort of metastatic cancer going through that immunotherapy and saw how they did over a year and it, it turned out that the state of their gut microbiome at the beginning was one of the biggest predictors of whether they would um, survive or not mm. and as expected it was you know, the good to bad ratio, loss of um, diversity. And it, we also looked at their diets and um, it was the lack of fiber and positive aspects of those that followed a more Mediterranean diet had like double the rate of success of survival. And, you know, these, these figures aren't trivial. It's not a just tiny amount. If, you know, real difference between... Yeah. double your chances of success of uh, reaching 12 months. Wow. And yet, how many patients know, you know, the importance of this? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hardly. Yeah, it's how, interesting. How many oncologists discuss uh, diet as in, in such a powerful way? And um, this, you know, there's been some studies in, in for chemotherapy that haven't been very clear or very large, uh, which is, you know, this where you just sort of try and kill all the cells. Um, and there are um, some hospitals, like I think it's um, Sloan Kettering um, or, or MD Anderson, where they, they actually, if you're going through chemotherapy, they will take a sample of your gut microbiome and they'll store it in freezers. You have your chemotherapy, then they give it back to you as a booster. Mm -hmm. And so, and they've got 
data that improves survival as well. So you, I mean, that makes perfect sense. It's common. I mean, you're saying it's immediately what I thought of. Like, no matter how robust and great your microbiome is, if you're going into chemo or radiation, it's going to get obliterated, right? So, to culture it and be able to, you know, supplement or kind of, you know, uh, a lot, you know, have have a way of repairing that as you go along would seem to be kind of crucial and obvious. Yeah, and I think. We're all going to be storing our microbiome when we yeah. think we're at our healthiest. Mm. It's always hard to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, trust me, I'm going to get into fecal transplants. Like we, yeah, we should all we should have banks where we're where we're storing this stuff at our healthiest, right? So, yeah. you know, when we face some kind of crisis, we have the ability to kind of turbocharge our 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 microbiome, and in turn our immune system so yeah. that we can meet whatever we're facing in, it, the, in the best way. And as you said, there's some other examples in lymphoma, something called CART therapy is very complicated uh -huh. uh, using uh, T cells. And mm. the microbiome again is, is proving crucial in those uh, in lymphoma, just like a type of leukemia. So I think we're gonna see more and more of this. And I, I'm, I think the cancer area is one that the public can really relate to and, and this might be finally the barrier that gets it across to the medical profession how important uh, diet is uh, t and diet mm -hmm. and gut health because medics are still not being taught anything about this this whole area and nutrition is still sidelined as a minor thing but if we can show how important it is in cancer then hopefully um, everyone will be convinced and the word will get out but cancer patients are traditionally told to avoid fermented foods right they are yeah they certainly are in many places and i, I get lots of complaints from from patients saying um because what is the rationale uh, i think it comes to the days when at some point in chemotherapy you 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 are very vulnerable to infections mm -hmm. and so you have very few white cells to to fight infection and so they're worried about introducing bugs and obviously at that nadir in your treatment you don't want to be given large amounts of micros but for the vast majority of people most of the time these fermented foods could actually be saving their lives so there's a lot of misinformation out there and that um, we need to you know get oncologists and and doctors up to speed on on this this new area and mm -hmm. it's, it's moving very fast but fermented foods are really good for your immune system and as far as i know that you know they've they've never killed anybody who isn't who's got a few you know decent white some white cells yeah so so paint the picture of of what the future in your mind looks like from a personalized um, medicine perspective and a diagnostic and treatment perspective when you're able to perform you know really uh dialed in specific citizen science and you know data crunching to you know create um to create really powerful tools to treat better in a more bespoke way. I mean, what does that look like? And you do like I'm imagining how far, how you far had, in like, the future. We well, maybe about. like you know, ten years from now and fifty years from now. Like I've I've had futurists on here. I've heard mm -hmm. you know, like I think what's happening in I terms can't go of beyond ten years. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, like you know, there's a lot of interesting breakthroughs and developments in scanning and early detection and all of these things that are, are I think are really powerful in terms of catching things early on. Like so much of what we perish from. Uh, is avoidable if we could have caught it earlier. And, you know, kind of the technology is getting to a point where we're going to be able to detect these things so early on that we can, you know, deal with them in a really facile manner, you know, before they become problematic. Uh, but that's early treatment. The, yeah, that's, way. yeah, early treatment, right. And, and what you're talking about is just another piece in that, in that broader puzzle um, in terms of like where medicine and healthcare are, are heading, but you know, what is your, what does it look like from what well, you're seeing? Well, I'd love to see more about prevention rather than sort of early treatment and reverse you know, the major threat to the Western world, which is our poor diet, mm -hmm. which you know is is essentially killing us and uh, giving half the population of the US you know make diabetes and obesity and it's an insane statistic and so think about it you know ultra processed food is the, is the number one killer in this and 
the studies are clearly linking ultra processed foods and microbiome dysfunction and we've just let it happen you know we just let all these chemicals come into our food system uh, without a proper testing and the science is now showing that many of these emulsifiers that glue stuff food together um, the artificial sweeteners the sugar alcohols all these things that you see in ultra processed foods have a negative effect on our microbiome so you know i'd like to see a future where we're not just fighting an ever increasing number of diseases with with expensive mri scans we're actually going to do something at a population epidemiology level to say you know these foods they're like they come to cigarettes in the 1970s you know they should have health warnings on them not um uh health promotion benefits right. to say yeah. Yeah. yeah this is healthy because yeah. it's got some vitamin iron or whatever it yeah. is yeah, some like, nonsense in it. yeah fortified with vitamin it's c a, or d yeah, or there k be a warning or, says if it comes yeah. if it comes with uh, some health advice it's bad for you, you know, that, <laughs> that would be a, a good <laughs> sticker um so i i'm i'm really into prevention uh, and i think we're gonna we're gonna see that the tools for you know rather than trusting in doctors that individuals are empowered to do this themselves i think this is the way it's going to happen and we've seen already you know how these devices are changing people's lives just in the last few years the glucose monitor there'll be the lipid monitor um we know all the major smartwatch manufacturers are, are going to moving towards this they'll have mm -hmm. laser devices that will be able to pick up different blood measures in in you in real time these will be fed back through algorithms in your phone and uh, you know the vision of, of uh, companies like zoe is to also tell people not only what's happening to their body in real time but what they're eating in real time so with the complexity of the ultra processed food it's very hard to know what you're actually eating mm -hmm. how bad is it how many of these chemicals are bad for you are you the one in three people that reacts to carrageenan you know which is an emulsifier that will glue your microbes together but not other people's you know you, which artificial sweetener if you have to have one you know would you have this per level of personalization can only be so complicated you need apps and advice to be able to do it to guide you through it so i think we'll be using these devices to find our way uh, through the food jungle mm -hmm. point us to say what ideally we should be eating keep us logged about how we're, you know how well are we doing in our 30 plants a week hints of new things to try and telling us when we should be taking our exercise um, relative to where our last night's sleep was um, everything should be optimized but also not just making us robots but making us more intelligent more educated about what we're doing mm -hmm. so that we realize that, you know this is an evolving science and it and if everyone is part of a a giant citizen science project then everyone benefits and i think that's that's my vision of the future is that we will have this sort of benevolent um uh, companies you like there'll be a, a group of people who can pay for all these um tools but that information will pass to the people that can't pay for them and they will get predicted scores that are free and um we'll we'll move to a time when this is possible so realizing that you know as we talk about cancer yes you can have an mri scan that can detect that cancer early but wouldn't you be better to know how to boost your immune system so that your immune cells do it beat that cancer mm -hmm. before it's even detected by the mri scanner and yeah. rather than rely upon uh the food pyramid that's the result of a political process to have a personalized food pyramid that is specific to you and you alone which is what you talk about in the new book yeah, yeah i think this this is definitely the future but it's but it's also understanding what the foods we're eating and you know and moving away from this old-fashioned idea of calories mm -hmm. 